All right, history 132, uh, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to run down the list. There's a lot happening with Unit 7, Chapter 28. I was talking in the last video about the birth of participatory democracy. We're looking at the advent of the free speech movement. We're at looking at uh, further advent of the women's movement at this particular point. Um, what you have to remember is a couple of things. It is uh, people are discovering that they have a voice. People are discovering, in some cases, they have a choice. Um, we went from World War II to the Korean War. Now we're in the Vietnam War, and you're going to have people that are tired of fighting, people that are tired of killing, people that are starting to ask the question, why are we killing? What are we doing there? And do we need to be there? Um, you're going to have the birth, um, or further birth, pardon me, uh, of the conscientious objector, because this is really going to start to come to the fore, because also what we're looking at is what we call the hippie movement. Um, some call it the free love movement, some call it at, um, a variety of different things. Here's the issue. Um, people are going to start reinterpreting the Bill of Rights. Uh, they're going to start reinterpreting whether or not they need to be out there fighting. They're going to start asking questions, and they're going to start saying, hey, listen, um, maybe we're not fighting for the reasons we think we are. Um, this movement, whether it's a hippie movement, a free love movement, whether it is a variety of things, um, I know that in the text it talks about uh, Timothy Leary and talks about making love and not war, talks about tuning in, turning on, and dropping out. Um, this is a big birth of um, the LSD movement, of the drug movement, a uh, huge uh, um, acid movement at this particular point with the uh, LSD. We're looking at a shift in America, and the shift in America, it's a great thing. If we were actually sitting in class, what I'd do is I would put together a string of videos for you to look at, and what it is is music. <clears throat> I, I would love it if you would actually go on YouTube and look up music from the 50s, and you find... Um, Sock Hop Rock, uh, you found Rock Around the Clock, you find Bill Haley in the Comets, you, you find Elvis Presley, uh, of all people. And then as you shift, we, live, we, we look at, and we go from um, those folks into, gosh, people like the Beatles. You go um, from Chubby Checker into the Beatles. You go from the Beatles into uh, the Beach Boys. We're looking at a transition where we go from rock to hard rock to acid rock um, to some really colorful induced rock. I mean, um, Iron Butterfly is here at that particular point. Um, gosh, there are just so many things. But what you look at, even if you just follow the arc of the Beatles, the Beatles go from relatively clean-cut, long-haired guys in suits to uh, the folks in Yellow Submarine and the ones that are, are doing Sgt. Pepper's The Lonely Hearts Club Band. And if you look at those videos, you go, oh my gosh, these guys are so wasted. They're so high on something because we're looking at a transition in rock. Part of this hippie movement, you'll see right here, um, Woodstock comes in. Um, that is a whole part of the culture of the time period. So definitely look at that. But keep in mind, part of this conscientious objector, part of this not wanting to go to war, part of this speaking up, is going to have its birth, really, this blossoming on university campuses and college campuses. And this is where that free speech movement is just going to go and just blow up. If you talk to Herbert Hoover, the gentleman who used to be in charge of the FBI, he would say that college campuses are a breeding ground for communism. Because according to him, anybody who doesn't agree with him or his version of the government is a communist. Well, we're looking at some huge movements here. Uh, the weathermen come in here. Ralph Nader, who's not a weatherman, but who is an activist, comes in here. Jane Fonda comes in here. There's a lot of people happening that we're discovering have different ideas, and it's this launch of different ideas that are coming in. Um, I love the book uh, Notes Betty Frieden comes in. Um, she talks about something called the feminine mystique. Guys, I got news for you. Um, women are different than men. Ladies, that's not news to you, but, you know, it, it is news to the guys um, because it's not just a physiological or, or difference. It's not just a physical difference, but... Um, Sometimes the approach, sometimes the psychology, sometimes the thought processes, you know, are affected uh, by experiences. And your experience as a guy, my experience as a guy, is not the same as the experience of a woman. 
And so what we're starting to look at here is this feminine mystique, this uh, discussion by Betty Friedan, this uh, birth of uh, the National Organization for Women. Um, Title IX comes into place here. ERA comes into place here. The battle for uh, reproductive rights, also known as Roe v. Wade comes into here because people are starting to question and demonstrate and demand some things at this particular point in time. So make sure that you're paying attention to those. One thing the book notes here, uh, right before we get into Cesar Chavez and the American Farm, United Farm Workers, is the Bracero program. What you have to know about the Bracero program, it is the um, legal documentation importation of folks from Mexico to come across the border openly, willingly, on a regular basis to work in factories, to work in fields, whether migratory or, or uh, sedentary, whether they work in one place or they work in several and shifting according to the seasons. But there's a shortage of workers during World War II, and so we invite folks, these immigrants now that we seem to, for some reason, detest so badly, we invite them by the thousands into the country to come help and support us, and that's the Bracero program. The problem is, is after the war, we decide we don't want them anymore. We decide we want them to go home. We decide that we've used them up, and so we're going to go ahead and try some other things. And there's some terrible things that come of the fight to change this. Um, one of those is, and you have to pardon the term, but it's called Operation Wetback. And it is going to be Johnson's push to go ahead and send uh, what he figures now are unneeded workers, unneeded Mexican workers, and in some cases Mexican or American workers, home. Um, that's part of that United Farm Workers recognition of movement. Um, I've already mentioned the, the uh, Red Power movement and the American Indian movement. Um, that's going to fit in with some of those things happening. Uh, what else is happening is this struggle. Um, something big that comes in at this particular point is what we call the Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers are hugely important. What's going to happen is you're going to have somebody within the government who uh, is familiar with the Pentagon is uh, we're going to commission a report and the report is um, basically how do we win the war? How do we win this Vietnam War? And it's going to come out that as far back as Kennedy, we can't win the war that strategically, that fiscally, um, that material-wise, that they figure there's no way we can win the war. And the Pentagon Papers are going to tell us this back in the early 60s, and then the government is going to keep it secret. The presidents will keep it secret. The generals will keep it secret because nobody wants to admit we can't win the war. Nobody wants to be that president who loses. So instead, instead of trying to find a way out of this, we're going to repeatedly pump millions of dollars, um, thousands of American lives. We are going to uh, import, export guns and bombs and planes and ships and soldiers in an attempt to throw as many as we can at this particular problem. And this is where the draft comes in. This is where the peace movement comes in because what will happen is this will eventually hit the papers. It will eventually hit the papers that this is what the government has been up to. The government has lied to you. The presidents have lied to you. Um, all along, it's been a cover-up operation. This is huge because it's going to end up in the Supreme Court. Um, I note that I see Chief Justice Warren Berger in here, and this is part of the issue. It is, um, it's going to hit the newspapers, and then the president and the other policy advisors are going to bring it up in court to try to go ahead and stamp out the release of these papers. It will come uh, before the Chief Justice, and they'll demand they be let go. Um, they'll demand that it gets out there, and what this does is it ruins, it ruins the secrecy of the government. It ruins the secrecy of the office. And this is hugely important because this is the birth of part of that huge student movement. But also it's going to come back and haunt some folks like Richard Nixon here shortly. So um, I'm going to do one more video in this chapter and then move on.